Should be recording, yep. Okay, hello, this is uh, Physics 1B for September 1st. This is our first day of class. And uh, today what we're gonna be talking about are these topics right here. Hopefully you can read them. Let me go to full screen here. Um, I hope my I hope this thing still works. Let's see, does it? It does. All right, great. Can I still use that? I can. All right. So today what we're talking about are uh, properties of gases and liquids, uh, as well as uh, the subject of density, all things that you probably know a little bit about. Um, then we're going to talk about the idea of what pressure is. Then we're going to see how pressure varies with depth. This is something you probably know something about. Maybe you don't. I don't know. That if you, uh, for example, were to jump into a pool or the ocean or a lake or any, any body of water and uh, you swim to the bottom of the pool, um, what do you notice happens when you, if you go to the bottom of a pool? Say you swim all the way to the bottom of the pool. What do you notice happens to you? You float up. Yeah, your body tends to want to float up. That's one thing. But let's say you go down to the bottom of the pool and you just blow all the air out of your lungs. And you, you're you sitting down there at the bottom. Okay, Troy Waters says, I see pressure changes. There's pressure around you. Ear pressure gets more difficult to stay down there. You feel heavy for sure. Yeah, all these things are true. So um, your ears plug up. Yeah, you guys are all saying all the right stuff. So the key thing that this, this, the commonality between what you all are saying is that pressure changes. So the pressure goes up when you go down to the bottom of the water. Your ears plug up because the pressure has gone up. So we'll talk about what pressure is, uh, and then we'll talk about how pressure varies with depth, how it increases the deeper you go. Um, mostly because there's just a whole bunch of water above your head, and the weight of that water weighs down on you. That's basically what's happening. Then we're going to talk about Pascal's Law, which uh, is basically the same idea. Um, and then we'll get into Archimedes' principle. Archimedes is a scientist who is uh, he's a Greek scientist. Around a very long time ago, he figured out how buoyancy works. And his principle we still use today, which is pretty impressive. Imagine writing something down, <laughs> you know, thousands of years ago, and it's still true today. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty impressive. That doesn't happen very often. Um, so we'll talk about how things float and Archimedes' principle. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about uh, pressure gauges, barometers, and things and how they work. So that is, uh, that's the goal for today. So uh, let's get going. Um, so let's talk about uh, fluids. So this course, it starts off with talking about fluids. The first, I think, three weeks or so, we're going to not only be talking about fluids, but I think the first two labs we do will be about fluids. So what's a fluid? Well, a fluid is uh, it's kind of something that flows, basically. And it's effectively a gas or a liquid. Those are fluids. Okay, maybe even plasma is a fluid. Although if it is, it's a very different type of one. Um, so things that flow. For us in this class, that's going to be a gas or a liquid. So I don't, when you hear the word fluid, what do you think when you hear the word fluid? Do you think gas or liquid or do you think one or the other? Like you hear fluid, do you think like water? You think about cars, cars have fluids in them? Sure, now you gotta change your fluids in your car, right? For me, I think prior to taking physics, uh, I thought when I, when I heard the word fluid, I thought it was just liquids. I didn't, I didn't know that it was, you think of cats, that's nice. Um, I didn't, I didn't know that it was a gas or a liquid, but it is. Okay. And, um, when we're talking about gases and liquids, how can we describe them? What's, uh, what are some of the differences between gases and liquids? Cats can fit into anything just like fluids. Ha, that's, that's true. <laughs> that's true, I like that, Pat. <laughs> yeah, but uh, what are some of the differences between a gas and a liquid? Gas molecules move more sporadically. What do you mean by sporadically? What is sporadically? Like, kind of like randomly? More distance between how where they're moving around and stuff like, cover more space maybe. Liquid has cohesion, what's cohesion? Cohesion is like it kind of stick, sticks together. Is that what you mean? Liquids tend to be more dense than gases. We can say that for sure. So density, what is density? Density is basically just the mass of an object divided by its volume, right? 
So by saying that fluids are, okay, execution is getting to one of the more important details. That's right. Gases will always fill the container. Let's talk about that. So suppose that I take a container. Okay, I've got like a, uh, let's just say we have a beaker or something like that, right? Uh, if I, the atoms in the gas ignore the other atoms. That's a good way of putting it. Whereas the atoms in the liquid, what, they, they tend to kind of affect each other, right? They kind of, there's these light forces that hold them together. Molecules in a gas move around faster than compared to molecules in liquids. I think that's right. So let's say I take a, a gas and I take a liquid and I take two different vessels right here, right? Okay, so I've got, let's say that I've got a beaker of water and I pour, I pour water into this, right? Um, that water, right, is going to basically just fill up up to the level that I pour it to, right? And it will all stay inside of this container, right? What happens if I were to pour a gas? So let's say that I have a beaker of, not a beaker, but like a... Uh, um, let's say I have liquid nitrogen, not liquid nitrogen. That's not, that's a bad example. <laughs> I guess it's a good example because it will, what's well, a gas that we could pour into something? It's hard to imagine. So maybe instead of that, let's say that we just empty our lungs into this thing. Okay. So that, that's something we can all understand, right? So let's say that we just blow into this gas. Like we blow our, we empty our lungs into this container so that it's filled with air, right? What's, what's going to happen to that air? Will it, will it actually stay inside of the container if we blow it inside of there? What will happen? We blow a bunch of air into this thing. We put our hand over the top or something like that. No, it won't, right? What's going to happen to that air? It disperses outside of the container. In fact, it'll just basically go and fill whatever room we're into. It'll escape and it'll mix into the room, right? Right, so, um, so basically liquids will tend to basically form to whatever we put them into, whatever container we put them into. But gases, that's not really going to happen. They're just going to expand, disperse out as far as they possibly can, right? Okay. So you all hit on a lot of the differences of what gases and liquids are. You, you, you kind of pointed out a lot of different things. Um, you said some things that matter. The, the, the molecules inside of the water itself tend to have uh, little forces that kind of hold them closer together, whereas the molecules of the gas just basically kind of tend to zip around very rarely interacting with each other, um, and they kind of spread out to fill up uh, whatever room you put them into. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about the symbols that we use for this type of thing. Uh, I'm sure in your chemistry classes, maybe even in your biology classes, you talk about density. And unfortunately, you know, that we don't have any standards across all the sciences. We all use different symbols. The symbol we use for density is this one. It looks like a P but it's, it's the Greek letter rho, so it's like a curly little R. It's like a curly P, right? It's like a curly P. So that's the symbol we use for density, and then of course the symbol we use for mass is usually little m, and the symbol we use for V is usually a capital V, like this. So that's our definition of what uh, density is. It's important to understand that it, that also means that we can define the mass of an object if we know what its density is and we know what its volume is, we can find mass by finding, you know, density multiplied by volume. We can take that a step further because we have this concept of weight that we learn about. And how is weight defined in physics? You remember? It's hard for you to shift from using D for density. Do I care which one you use? Well, in this class, the letter D is going to be used to represent like a derivative. Does that make sense, Christian? Mass times gravity is what weight is. That's exactly right. Um, does that make sense, Christian? So um, th there could be, you'll see it come up here very, very quickly, why there could be some confusion if you use D. That being said, as long as it makes sense to you when you're doing your homework, that's totally fine. You know what I mean? That's totally fine. But I would recommend maybe using a capital D instead of a lowercase d. That might help because that could pretty easily distinguish it from the derivative d, right? Um, I, as long as your work's clear, if you start a problem off and you say this, you say d, and you say this is density, right? And you know, then you go about doing your problem. Then that's okay. You know, you're welcome to define the terms of anything you do. It's like programming, right? In programming, sometimes you. You have to define variables, right, in some certain programming languages. Um, however you define everything is fine as long as you set everything up and define it. 
So Krishna, it's okay. Just uh, make sure everything's clear. That's all that matters. Okay, weight is mass times gravity, as we said. Mass is density times volume, right? So we can put those together and we can say that you can find the weight of an object by just doing density times volume times gravity. Now, why do we care about this? Well, because maybe sometimes we don't know the mass, but we know a lot of information about the density and we know a lot of information about the volume. After all, these two quantities are very easy to know. With density, density is something that you can kind of just look up in a table. And I'll, I'll mention a couple of important densities here. The density of water, which is something we're gonna use a lot in this class, is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. It's kind of a reference density. It's not, it's not by chance that it turned out that water happened to have a density of exactly 1,000. This was designed this way, okay? Let me write down one other one. The density of air, which will also be something that might be useful to us from time to time, is about 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. Okay, and now you can actually see what unit we're using for density. We're using mass over volume. So what's volume in the uh, uh, MKS system? Well, it would be meters times meters times meters, meters cubed. There are, of course, other ways to measure volume, right? In your chemistry class, you probably used uh, liters or milliliters, right? That's also a perfectly acceptable way to use uh, volume, and you can define densities that way as well, um, as you know, grams per milliliter, grams per cubic centimeter. There's all kinds of different ways to do this, but it turns out that it's um, there's some really simple conversions between all these different units. And let me mention one thing about that. Do you all know how they originally defined the kilogram? Does anyone know how they originally defined what a kilogram was? It's based on water, yeah. Do you know exactly how it's based on water? It's okay if nobody does, I'm just asking. A cubic meter of water. Okay, now how much would a cubic meter of water weigh? Let's think about this. Anyone tell me? If we know that the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, how much does one meter cubed of water uh, What's the mass of one meter cubed of water? Thousand kilograms? Yeah, that's right, Donald. That's exactly right. How'd you do that? Well, mass is density times volume, right? So the mass would be density, which is a thousand. Always be sure to write units when you do these things. Hopefully you all have learned that by now, but I'm sure it's easy to forget. If we multiply by one meter cubed, we get a thousand kilograms, right? Okay, so um, my question was, what's the... Uh, Oh, cubic centimeter, Brian? Is that what that's what you think it is? Okay, let's see if that works. Let's see. Let's see how much a cubic centimeter will weigh. Maybe one of you can calculate that for me. How much would a cubic centimeter of water weigh? I'm just I'm drawing a little cube here that we can use so I can show the dimensions and stuff like that. One cubic centimeter of water. How much would that what would the mass of that be? One centimeter cubed. How many meters cubed is this? One gram. Well, let's try. Let's do this calculation. So, if we take one centimeter cubed, and I want to figure out the mass, okay, let me make sure. Let me make it clear what we're doing here. So how would I do that calculation? I want to find the mass of one centimeter cubed of water. How do I make this text bigger? I can't remember. Right here. How would I do this calculation? One centimeter cubed of water. Can anyone tell me what do I need to do? Centimeter cubed is a volume, right? This is our equation to find mass, and this is our density. So what was one additional step I need to do before I can use this equation really, right? What is that step? What do I need to do? 
Uh, you need to convert the density to be uh, with a unit mass per centimeter cubed. Okay, that's one option. Or we could just convert the volume to centimeters cubed to be the same thing, right? Or we could convert the volume to meters cubed. It would be the same thing, right? Yeah, that right. Okay, so let's let's just do that. So volume is one centimeter cubed. What do I need to multiply this by? What kind of conversion factor? If I want to get it into meters cubed. Now the way I usually would do this would just be well, I want meters cubed up here. I'm gonna to have to have some kind of centimeter down here. And I don't know how many meters cubed there are in a centimeter cubed. Maybe some of you do. I I don't. Uh, but one person saying one meter is 10 centimeters. That's not, that's close. It's not quite right. Centi means one out of a hundred. So it's a hundred centimeters. This is the relationship. So usually what I do when I'm trying to convert one of these, um, a measurement that's cubed, what can I do to the conversion factor to make this so that I get something in meters cubed on the end? Can I do something to this conversion factor here so that my answer comes out in meters cubed? You can cube it. That's right, Robert. Exactly. So now if I cubed the conversion factor, right? So I take one over a hundred, which this is equal to one, right? Remember that conversion factors are always equal to one, right? One meter is equal to hundred centimeters. That means that by dividing one meter by hundred centimeters, this, this ratio is one. And I don't change the ratio at all if I cube it because one cubed is, is one, right? One to any power is one. Right? So this whole thing is equal to one. So it's perfectly acceptable to multiply by one. It doesn't change anything. So if I take one centimeter cubed and I multiply by one divided by 100 to the third power, what do I get over here on this side? What do you get if you do this multiplication out here? Point zero, 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 one, which would also be what one times ten to the negative six? Yeah. One times ten to the negative six. Okay, good. Everyone agree? Get a lot of the same answers. That looks good. That looks good. Okay, so let's do mass now. So now mass is gonna be equal to again density times volume. One thing uh, I'm gonna say just to keep keep you guys on track with how I how I expect you to do homework and stuff like that is, so we, we calculated our volume now, right? I'm gonna plug it into my equation, simple equation. I'm still gonna rewrite the equation right here and then I'm gonna plug the numbers in, okay? So density was 1000 kilograms per meter cubed. That's always gonna be what the density of water is in this class. Oof, uh, it's hard to read, I apologize. Getting back into the struggles of trying to write on this uh, tablet. So, oh, whoops. Density times volume, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, multiplied by the volume. I don't want to write this number out and mess it up again, so I'm just going to copy it down here. Uh, you know what? It's definitely a little easier to use um, scientific notation, I think, in this case. So we'll do that. And we do this, and we do this, equals. And then you could do this kind of quickly here because 1,000 is, is, is 1 times 10 to the 3, right? Multiplying by 1 times 10 to the negative 6, so that should be 1 times 10 to the negative 3, right? Kilograms. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? That would be the mass. Okay, quick, simple density calculations. Now again, we still haven't figured out the answer to the original question, which is how did they, how did they initially define a kilogram, okay? And so our first couple guesses, which are good guesses, the first guess was the volume of one meter cubed. Um, it cuts off, the Discord chat cuts off a portion of the right side of the answer. I'll have to fix that uh, after the break or during the break. Thanks, Troy. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'll fix it after the break. I had to set it up like within the first few minutes of class. So, okay, so. Um, you just realized this cube is ungodly perfect. Well, it was constructed by you know, using shapes up here, so it's not that hard to do so. Um, anyway, and I, I, I will try as hard as I can when I'm when I'm using diagrams in this class to use like the shapes so that it comes out neat so you guys can see it. I'll do my best to do that, unless we're just in a really big hurry. Now, the, the original question here was, 
uh, how did they define one kilogram, right? And so our first guess was, it was a good guess, that it was the mass of one meter cubed of water. We found out that one meter cubed was a thousand kilograms. That's a little bit too much because we're looking for one kilogram. The second guess, which is also a good guess, was that it was that it was the volume of one centimeter cubed of water. But that turned out to be a little too small because actually this, and someone got this right actually earlier, I should point out, one time since the negative three kilograms is in fact one gram. I think that was you. Uh, get your name right real quick here. Uh, Mustafa, you're the one that figured that out, right? That's one gram, right? One time since the negative three kilograms, that's one gram. So again, the question is, how do I get one kilogram, okay? Anyone figure it out? Well, we can go about this in a different way. If we know that we want to get a mass of one kilogram, okay, and we know what the density is, the density is a thousand kilograms per meter cubed, we could ask the question, what do we want the volume to be then? Right, we can just we can just calculate that, right? That's not super hard. Because we can use our formula, rearrange a little bit, say volume is equal to mass divided by density. Just rearrange this one up here. Are you all able to see my uh, my cursor, by the way? I know sometimes I've heard people, you can't, okay, good. All right, so if volume is mass divided by density, let's plug these numbers in here. So we've got one kilogram you divide by 1,000 kg per meter cubed. That gives us our volume. Well, one over 1,000, that's pretty easy. That's 0 .000, 000, not 0 0.001, and that is gonna be in meters cubed. So here's the thing. The original definition of the kilogram was based on the mass of a cube whose volume was equal to this. That was the original definition of a kilogram, a mass of a cube whose volume was 0 0.001 meters cubed, but that's not how they said it. They said it's the mass of a cube whose sides had length, what? What would the length of these sides be here? It's not, no, it's not a centimeter cubed. That's not right. This is not the same thing. This was the volume of a centimeter cubed. A centimeter cubed was one times 10 to the negative six, this is one times 10 to the negative three. So this is a thousand times bigger than a centimeter cubed. You could fit a thousand centimeters cubed inside of this object, actually, if you think about it. You take little tiny cubes that have a, a size of one centimeter, one, one centimeter cubed that would fit in. 0.001 meters on all sides. I don't think that's gonna work. Any other guesses? If we do 0 0.001 meters on all sides, the volume, Donald got it. Donald got it. The length has to be 0 0.1, 0 0.1 meters. Because if the length is 0 0.1 meters, the volume of a cube is equal to the length cubed, right? And sorry, the length of a side cubed, right? So if a side is 0 0.1 meters, and then we cube that, you also get a volume of 0 0.001 meters. So I guess the shortest way to put it is a kilogram is the mass of a cube whose sides are 0.1 meter. What is that? A decimeter? We never use the decimeter, but it is a decimeter, right? D-E-C-I, or 10 centimeters. That might be a better way to say it, Pat. A cube whose sides are 10 centimeters on each side, because we have a better idea of what 10 centimeters is. Like 10 centimeters is like something like about like that, right? So you can imagine a cube of that size, it weighs a kilogram if you fill it with water. All right, well, that's a, a lot of information about density. Let's see how we're doing on time. 10, 20, we're doing fine. So when we're talking about fluids, mass is an important thing. Mass is always an important thing in physics, right? I mean, in physics 1A, mass showed up in almost every problem, probably, right? If you're talking about kinetic energy, you've got mass. If you're talking about potential energy, you've got mass. If you're talking about uh, momentum, there's mass. You're doing F equals MA, well, there's a, there's a mass in there, right? Mass is obviously a very important thing in physics, you know? Not surprising that if we're gonna talk about fluids, and that's what the goal today is to learn about, how do we, how do we talk about fluids? Mass is obviously an important part, right? Um, okay, 
So we've now introduced this idea of density and volume and how these are all interacting with each other. So what are the other things about a fluid that we need to know? Well, the next thing that we're gonna to need to know is pressure. Pressure is gonna be the next kind of important characteristic of a fluid that we wanna talk about. Pressure. Okay. Later on, we'll also add in velocity. Ah, but let me, let me emphasize one thing that we're talking about today. Today, what we're talking about is fluid statics. Statics means things that are sitting still, right? So as far as things that are sitting still go, they will have masses, they will have pressures, they will not have velocities, right? That's the difference between statics and dynamics, right? If we want to talk about something that's dynamic, it needs to move. And if it's going to move, it needs to have some velocity or something like that, right? So that'll be for uh, next week. This week, we're just talking about statics. And with statics, we need to talk about pressure. So what is pressure? Well, if I take a vessel of some type, so let's say we have a, a container, and um, I'm gonna do some things to, let's open the container up here on the top. So we have a container, and then we're gonna fill this container up with a fluid, like let's say water. Okay, so we fill the whole thing up with water all the way to the top. And, you know, let's imagine that uh, we take an object of some kind, okay? And in our case, let's say we take something that's shaped like a triangle. Let's not make it this color, let's make it this color. So we take an object, maybe it's a, a wedge of wood or something like that and um, we stick it inside of here, okay? So we've got some piece of wood that we've, that we've submerged inside of our water, right? Okay. And um, I guess just for, just to make things, um, I, I don't want to complicate things too much. So what does the water do? Okay, well, water is full of water molecules, right? Little tiny water molecules represented by these dots. And what are they doing? Are, they all, are all those water molecules sitting still? Are they all at rest? No. What do they do? If it was frozen, not frozen, yeah. So if the water was frozen, we would, we would think of the water molecules as being rest, but as long as it's in liquid form, uh, the water molecules are zipping around, right? So you gotta imagine that some of these water molecules are zipping around in this direction. Maybe this one over here is going in that direction, but some of them are probably going towards the surface of the object, right? Not all of them, but some of them have to be. Maybe half of them, I don't know. Some of them have to be going towards the object, right? And they're zipping around incredibly fast, and there is a, an unimaginable number of them as well, right? The number of actual molecules inside of this is a huge number, right? Think Avogadro's number, number, right? Like 10 to the 23, 10 to the 25, something like that, depending on how much water we have in here. There's a ton of them. And if a small fraction of them were to hit the side of the surface at one time, well, that surface of our piece of our object that's inside of here, it'd feel a force, wouldn't it? Just like if someone were to throw a baseball at you and it hit you in the chest, you'd feel a force, right? So if you've got a bunch of little baseballs or marbles or whatever you want to think about the molecules as, and they're constantly hitting this surface right here, the net effect of all of that, right, is that there's going to be a force on this surface here. And we can kind of sum it up into just one thing. We can say there's going to be a force and it's gonna exert on this surface right here. Okay, there's gonna be some kind of force that is perpendicular to that surface right there. And there's also gonna be forces like that on all the other surfaces. There's gonna be a force over here, whoops. Let me fix that. I want to make these forces just be perfectly perpendicular here. Okay, there's gonna be a force perpendicular like that. This little symbol means perpendicular. And there's gonna be a force pushing up on the bottom. And of course, any object is gonna be three-dimensional. So there's also gonna be a force pushing in on the front of it, right? And a force from the back pushing in on the back, right? So you're gonna have all of these forces acting on this object right here. Now, um, force perpendicular. Those forces um, that are perpendicular to the surface 
are a result of the water pressure, basically, okay? And the way we describe pressure is like this. This is the definition of pressure. Pressure is equal to force divided by area, okay? And the way that pressure works is it pushes on every single surface of the object, okay? Now, I don't want to imply that each of these forces are going to be the same. That's definitely not true. I'm just saying that there is a perpendicular force that pushes on these surfaces, and that perpendicular force produces, um, whoops, what's it doing? Here, just erase this. That perpendicular force produces um, this phenomenon that we call pressure. We use the symbol P for pressure. Let me indicate that this is pressure. The symbol for P, if you're kind of, uh, is that a, a sum or sigma for all the forces? What do you mean? Did I write a sigma symbol somewhere that I'm confusing you with? I'm sorry. We'll, we'll talk. Um, yeah, there, there'd be multiple forces acting on this object. That's right. Um, yeah, there's not just one force. That's right. There's different forces on each face. That's right. And we'll talk about what happens when we add these up here in a second. Okay. All right. So that's what pressure is. It's force divided by area. And in a fluid, the fluid will always exert pressure all, you know, all around and perpendicular to the surface of all, all, any object that's in the fluid. Okay. Let me give you another example. So you, right now, everyone in this room, or in, in, this, uh, in your own rooms, you're all subject to air pressure right now, right? Because your entire body is surrounded by a fluid of air, right? And your, your body feels air pressure, right? Now, you don't notice it most of the time. Um, and you probably wouldn't notice if the air pressure changed too much either. But just like the little water molecules that are zipping around and bouncing off the surface of this object, there's also air molecules in the room that are zipping around and bouncing off of your face, just hitting you all the time, making little tiny, you know, impacts like, you know, like, like asteroids from space or meteors from space hitting your face, kind of little tiny impacts from these air molecules. And all of that sums up to what we call air pressure. And um, we have, you know, a number for this kind of stuff. We can, we can define a number for these things. The unit that we use for pressure in this class, does anyone know what the unit we use for pressure in physics is? What's the unit we use for pressure? It's a Pascal, that's right. So we say one Pascal, and because pressure is defined as force divided by area, and force is normally measured in Newtons, area is measured in meters squared, then one Pascal is one Newton per meter squared. Put it another way, the symbol we use for Pascal is the PA. That's a P with a little a, and this is equal to one Newton per meter squared. Okay, now the earth has pressure and the air pressure near the surface of the earth um, so at sea level we can go out and we can measure how much air pressure there is. And maybe if you took a chemistry class at any point in time, you may have learned that there's another way to measure pressure. Um, does, does anyone know how you measure pressure in, uh, in your chemistry classes usually? Or what's one way you do it in your chemistry classes? Atmospheres, right? And what's the air pressure at, at sea level? It's one atmosphere, right? Okay, so one atmosphere Okay, ATM is equal to, well, we can write that in Pascals. And in Pascals, it's going to be about 101, 3,000, 101,300, excuse me, 101,300 Pascals. That's one atmosphere of pressure. Air pressure at sea level. One atmosphere of pressure. Now we can, um, 
we can think about the effect that this has. Um, let's say that you have uh, let's say that you have a room in your house, okay? I'm going to draw it just as a, as a single house, but let's say that you have a room in your house. And um, let's ignore the part of the top. So this is just a roof. So we have a room here, okay? And we'll give it some kind of three-dimensional nature so we can have uh, a way to talk about that. Uh, and let's say um, that this room is um, 10 meters is too big. Let's, let's say it's five meters by five meters, okay? Let's say the floor of this room is five meters on this side. It's five meters on this side, okay? So this is the floor of the room that we're, that we're talking about now. And I'm gonna draw this in here like this. So the floor of this, this room is, uh, is five meters by five meters, okay? And the only thing that's inside of this room is air, okay? So it's an empty room. Maybe it's an empty house that someone's just moved out of or something like that, okay? Um, let's ask the question of um, what, is the, what is the weight of the air on that bottom floor? Does that make sense? Or what's the force that the air places on the bottom floor? Okay, does the question make sense? What is the force that that air places on the floor of five meters by five meters? And I'm going to let you calculate this yourselves, but um, I'll start off by saying that what we'll do, and the idea here, of course, is that there's air in this room. It exerts pressure. It exerts pressure on all surfaces. That means it's going to exert a force down this way on the floor. It's going to exert a force on the walls. It exerts a force on the ceiling. It exerts a force on all surfaces. But we're just going to look at the force the air places on the floor, okay? Um, and we want to calculate what that's equal to. And what I'm going to say is that we can rearrange this equation. Pressure equals force over area. We multiply area to the left-hand side. You get force is equal to pressure times area, right? And we should be able to use that information to calculate what the force that the air places on the floor is. Can you all calculate that for me? OK, so one person got an answer. I'm going to let other people do the calculation themselves, and then we'll do it together. What do you all think? Okay, you got two answers that are pretty far off from each other. That's that's really good, actually. I like seeing uh, people get different answers. That means we have something we can talk about. Okay, now more people are getting this. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, assuming house and seal. Good point, Troy. I didn't say that, but since I only gave you one value for pressure, that's all we can lose. Okay, looks like a lot of people are getting the same same answer. Okay, let's plug some numbers in here, and you got, and you guys can just verify that this is what you did. So we need a pressure times an area. Well, we have a pressure from the air pressure right here, so that's one oh one three hundred pascals, and we can multiply that times an area. So the area is 5 by 5 meters, right? So that would be 25 meters squared, just multiplying 5 by 5. And yeah, it looks like most what, what you're writing has to be right. I mean, it's about 25 times about 100,000, which is going to be about 2.5 million. Right? That sounds about right. So this is about 2.5. I'm just going to write it like this. 2.5, we'll round it down to just two sig figs. 2.5 times 10 to the sixth, right? Uh, and that's going to be in newtons because Pascal is newton per meter squared, right? If we look at the way the units work out here, we have a newton per meter squared multiplied by a meter squared, which of course is going to give us a newton. So our answer is in newtons. Well, that's a pretty big force, right? Yeah, Christian, that same force, that same force is pushing on the walls, let's assume that the entire thing is a cube, just to make it simple. If the walls have the same dimensions, right, 
then that same force is pushing on the walls, right? The same force is pushing on the ceilings. I mean, just think about that. It's, it's almost like uh, there's all this air that's trapped in here, and as it pushes on all the surfaces, it's like, you know, it's like a balloon. Think about it like a balloon, right? If you blow up a balloon, you're pushing air into the middle of it, and the balloon expands, right? Um, the air inside of here is pushing on all the surfaces, almost like it's trying to escape from the room. Because after all, that's what air does, right? It tries to escape from anything you put it into, right? So how can we explain that? I mean, if you have this massive force of 2.5 million newtons, and okay, let's put this in a number that we actually understand, because I think a newton is about a quarter of a pound, right? Isn't that right? So if we divide by a quarter, divide by four, this would be about 600,000 pounds. Is that right? Can someone check that for me? It's a huge number, right? Six hundred thousand pounds. It almost can't. It almost can't be right. You know, it almost. It's it's almost just, just too big. Um. But unless I wrote this number down wrong, which I don't think I did. I'm pretty sure this is atmospheric pressure. Then this is what you get. So how can we reconcile that? How can you have six hundred thousand pounds of force, you know, pushing down here, pushing on the sides of the walls? I mean, how, how do these side walls not break? What is there that's happening on the outside of the walls that's preventing us from... from uh, you need something pushing it back, right? Okay, let's, let's blow up our picture of our house right here for just a second so we can draw some other lines. So let's, let's get rid of the, the forces on the bottom of the floor because as people have pointed out, these forces are everywhere. So let's just look at the force on the right wall. Okay. Yeah, Pat got it right. That's the right answer, Pat. So the force on the inside here is equal to this number right? But as Pat says, of course, there's air out here too, right? And that same air out there has, well, it has the same pressure, right? If the pressure in the room is at atmospheric pressure and the pressure outside is at atmospheric pressure, then you're going to have exactly the same force on the opposite side counterbalancing it. Exactly the same force, 100%. Why doesn't the space station sort of explode? Because you're saying because the, uh, the pressure from outside is is like space and the air inside. Uh, I don't know exactly the answer to your question. That's a really good question we could think about. Um, but they have to have, you know, something in place to, to uh, well, the air inside, that would be the first question is what's the pressure of the air inside, Troy, right? I don't know what that, that number would be. Uh, and then we'd have to figure out, um, that's a really good question. Let's, uh, let's look, let's look more into that. Okay. Christian, you're saying, uh, this might be too advanced, but what about when the pressures aren't equal, like with a soda can? Well, then, uh, you know, you can feel it, right? I mean, if you, if you grab a soda can, it's pressurized, right? The contents are kept under pressure. And when you squeeze a soda can, you can tell, you can feel that there's a pressure pushing back on you, right? But there's a there's a some, there's something preventing all that pressure from getting out, right? Which is the the fact that it's sealed, and since it's sealed and the air can't get out, um, the pressure is contained. And um, when you open the can, you can hear the pressure release, right? When you open the can, right? Because you hear the. Not only do you hear something, but if you like, if you open a can of Coke, there's like this this little gust of almost like mist that comes out of it, right? When you open it up. And that's, I think, a gas that's escaping that you're seeing that's, um, uh, you know, been held under pressure. I'm very interested to know about this question. So Troy asks, why does the space station explode? Yeah, so we, we would need to figure out the, um, how much air is actually in the space station. We need to figure out, um, you know, how, how are they actually containing those pressures? But... I, th I think the answer to your question, Troy, is actually contained within what Christian's saying, if you think about it, right? As long as everything is, is sealed, I think it's okay. I think it's okay. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Astro Lover knows. Pressure regulators, okay. Interesting. Interesting. What is a, can you tell us more? What is a pressure regulator?
Okay. Don't know more than that. Okay, well, let's, 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 let's I mean, if you want to read more about this, we can, and uh, we can talk more about it later. Okay, anyone have any questions about pressure? Any questions about pressure? Let me say a couple other things about pressure that are, uh, I don't know, things that we kind of tend to talk about a lot. Um, let's talk about a, a thumbtack, okay? Let's talk about a thumbtack. So how does a thumbtack work? So let's say I have a wall right here, and I'm going to push a thumbtack into it, okay? So here's my thumbtack. It's going to be very, uh, I, can, I can do better than that. Let's make it at least look somewhat like it. Thumbtacks are usually like, usually shaped kind of like this, right? Okay, so a thumbtack, right? This is related to pressure, how this thing works, right? So if I if I push on a thumbtack with my thumb, right? So here's my thumb right here. We'll just use one finger. So I'm just going to push uh, the thumbtack in with my thumb in this direction, right? So I'm pushing this way. Um, how does the thumbtack end up working? Well, I exert a force on this side, right? We'll just put it right here. Yeah, we'll put it right here. So you exert a force here, right? That's the force that you push on with, right? We'll just say you push. You push with some force. God, it looks so bad. Boy, you get really out of, uh, I'm not going to say that I'm very good at using these tools or anything like this, but I will say that uh, a summer of not using them makes you very bad at them, so I need to get back into being better. So you push with some force, right, in this direction. And that means that when the thumbtack is going into the wall, then that thumbtack is feeling that same force, right? But the thumbtack is able to pierce the wall while your thumb doesn't get pierced. What I mean by that is that when you push the thumbtack into the wall, while it might hurt your thumb a little bit, it doesn't hurt nearly as badly as if you were to, you know, do something like this. Let's say instead of uh, pushing a thumbtack into a wall, let's try something else. Suppose you try to push a nail into the wall. So this is a nail, right? If you take a nail and you take your thumb, right, and you also try to push on the nail and push it into the wall, what's going to happen? Let me put it this way. Do any of you think you could take a nail and using your thumb push it into a wall, assuming that the wall is not, you know, made of styrofoam or something like that, assuming that's like a hard wall? Let's say you're trying to push it into a piece of wood, just to be really, really clear. The nail, yeah, if you manage to actually get it to move in, the nail may pierce your thumb, and why would that be? What's the difference between the thumbtack and the nail that makes it so that the thumbtack is, is usable? What is the difference between the two objects that makes it so that the thumbtack it makes it easy for you to push things into the wall, but the nail it's not, the area? The surface area of where you're pushing into. Bigger surface to push on. All these things are exactly right. Bigger surface area, larger area top push. Those are all exactly right, exactly. Yeah, the area of this is bigger, right? And so what does that mean? If the area um, is bigger right here, that means that the force that you're pushing with, which by the way, when you push on the, the thumbtack, it pushes back on you with the same force, right? Um, that force is distributed over a larger area. That's exactly right. Now, why does the thumbnail work? Well, when the same force is distributed over a much smaller area, right? So if we take two different pressures, that's what's going on here, right? On this side over here, we'll use different colors for this. On this side over here, you feel some pressure. And then the wall feels some pressure over here. Two different pressures, right? Which one's bigger? Well, pressure one is going to be equal to the same force divided by the area, well, we'll call it, we'll just say divided by big area. That's pressure one. Pressure two is same force divided by small area. So just as you all were saying, because the force is spread out over a big area, the pressure is going to be small. So pressure one will definitely be smaller than pressure two, and pressure two will be big enough to pierce the wall, right? and puncture through the wall, but at the same time, pressure one will be small enough that it won't hurt your finger, right? Whereas with a nail, since the size of the nail is not that much different than the size of the nail head, then your thumb is uh, much, it's gonna be a lot harder to do this because you're gonna feel about the same pressure of the nail going into the wall on your thumb if you try to push a nail in. That means that the nail will basically just pierce into your, you'd be more likely to like, you know, push into your skin before it actually pushed into the wall. 
because your skin is a lot easier to push through than a, than a piece of wood, right? It's a lot easier to pierce into your skin than it is to pierce into wood, right? So, okay, so this, this has to do with uh, uh, pressure and area and force and how they all work, right? So that's another way to think about how pressure works. This, of course, is not related to fluids. This class or this course is about fluids, but that doesn't mean it doesn't help to think about pressure like this. Okay. Um, there's some other examples of things like this that we could talk about. I don't know, maybe you have some examples of stuff like this. Can you all think of any other experiences you've had in your life where some something like this is going on related to pressure? Can anyone think of another example of something where, where pressure can be uh, used to describe why something works the way that it does? That's a really vague question, isn't it? <laughs> Let me ask a more direct question. Have you ever seen a, a bed of nails? Have you, have you ever seen someone lie down on a bed of nails? Do you guys know what that is? So we've got a bed here. You still cringe at the thought, magic trick, et cetera, right, okay. So what's a bed of nails? Well, it's just, you know, it's exactly what it says. You've got some kind of a board and you have a lot of pretty much just really, really, really closely spaced nails usually spread throughout this, right? So we're gonna use all, I'm not gonna do a great job of drawing this, but. So we've got this bed and it has nails everywhere, right? There's just, there's nails all over the place. They're, they're put as close together as you possibly can. You put as many nails as you possibly can in here, right? Now all of these nails, they can be very, very sharp. It actually does not matter how sharp they are. That's not important. Probably matters a little bit, I guess, but. Um, so if a person lies down on this, right? Use different color. So if a person were to lie down on this bed of nails here, right? So they, they, they put their entire body weight on this, right? Um, all of the nails can support them. And you've probably, a lot of you have probably seen this. If you haven't seen it, maybe you've, maybe you've heard of it, I don't know. So when the person lies down on this, usually there's, there's really no damage done to their back or anything like this at all. And people will lie down on these things like barebacked. You know, they'll just, they'll take off their shirt and they'll lie down like, you know, on their back, with their back exposed to the nails, they'll lie down on it and they get up as if there's no problem at all, right? So why does this work? Well, many of you can probably answer the question, but I'm going to give you another another possibility to consider as to why that it works. And maybe this will help you to understand. Suppose that the same person did exactly the same thing, but instead of laying down on a bed of nails, they laid down on one nail. Right? We all know what's going to happen. You, if a person tries to lay down on top of one nail, what's going to happen? Distribution of weight. You can see so that's exactly right. That's what's going on. If you lie down on top of one nail, you try to lay back onto one nail, and you try to put your whole weight on that one nail, what is going to happen? It'll pierce you, 100%. This is 100% going to pierce you, right? You'll wake up with sharp back pain. That's true. <laughs> oh, man. That's, uh, that's true. So why is it different? Uh, well, as you all said, um, there's a distribution of weight thing that's going on here, right? So the nails have to hold up the weight of the person, right? So there's a downward force that this person is creating here, right? Which is basically their weight that goes down like this. So that means that the nails have to support their weight. But if there's like, let's say a thousand nails or something like that, right? Each nail only needs to support one one thousandth of your weight, right? only one one thousandth of your weight. So you can think about it like this. If it takes so much force for the nail to actually pierce into your body, then as long as you have enough nails, then you won't actually pierce through it because each one is supporting a tiny amount of your weight, right? You know, if you take a nail and you just kind of push it into your uh, thumb, it's not gonna puncture your thumb, right? You have to put a lot of pressure on to actually make a nail pierce your body if you really wanted to try it, right? I'm not saying you should try it. But the point is that the nail doesn't automatically just pierce your skin because you put it on your skin, right? Your skin has some integrity, some structural integrity that prevents it from piercing through, right? 
But if you if you multiply that over a bunch of nails, then it won't hurt you, right? We have we can do this when we go to school. You guys want to lay down on a bed of nails when you come back to class? You don't want to do that? No, I'm serious. We really do have this at school, and I will show you when we go to school. Except it's not this big. It's like this big, and instead of a person, we're going to put a balloon on it. But basically what I'll show you is that if I take a balloon and I put it on a bed of nails, okay? These nails are like rusty and sharp and nasty too. Like it's, you take a, take a balloon, you put it on a bed of nails, it won't puncture it. You take a balloon, you put it on a bed with a single nail, it'll 100% puncture it, right? So anyway, similar to the way that a thumbtack works and the way that pressure works, the pressure is evenly distributed here. Each one of the nails exerts a pressure on you, but any one of them isn't enough to pierce through your body. And the reason why this nail would exert a whole lot more pressure is of course because small area, same force, right? In both cases, the force is the same. This person is exerting a force down like this, which is their weight. Due to Newton's third law, the uh, nail is gonna exert an equal and opposite force up on the person. So both in both cases, the force is the same, except you've got big area in this case with all the nails versus small area in this case with one nail, right? And in this case, what could happen is that the area in this, on the left-hand side could be, let's say use a thousand nails, it's a thousand times as much area, right? That means the pressure is gonna be a thousand times less on the left than it would be on the right. Does that make sense to everyone? Thousand nails means a thousand times less pressure. One nail means, well, a lot of pressure, okay? You've had your, your clothes on fire? Whew, that sounds scary. Okay. Anyone have any questions? We're getting to that point where we probably take a break right now. Work mechanic, okay. Yeah, that's brutal, man. What's another one? Oh, the other one is snowshoes. I, I never know if anyone has any experience with snowshoes, so I don't know if that's another, if that's a good example. I think you all can kind of hopefully understand the bed of nails idea. Um, is this the same way that sharp knives work? Sure. What's the way to make a knife really sharp? Right? What's the way to make a knife really sharp? You need to have the blade be as like skinny as possible, right? If you have a dull knife, you know, like something that's really dull won't cut through something. But if you make the, if you make the point really, you know, if you make the, if you make the blade really skinny, then it's going to have the most uh, pressure when it cuts through things. Does it matter how you lay on it? Yes, it does. Del said, I don't think you could stand on it barefooted, probably, because if you were to stand on it, right, like your feet have much smaller area than your body. So all that, all the force would be forced into your feet, right? So you, you do need to have like your whole body laying on it. And you probably aren't going to want to like roll on your side or something like that because your side, I guess, depending on how your body's shaped, is usually going to be um, skinnier than your back. So how do you get on the bed of nails in the first place? I don't know, they usually just sit down and lay down on it, you know? It's been a long time since I saw someone do this, but my memory was that they just kind of like slowly load the, lowered their body onto it, just like you probably would. I mean, you probably don't want to just jump on it, right? I don't know. Um, so one other example of this is snowshoes, but I always wonder, I mean, has it, has anyone in here used snowshoes before? I never, I never have. I've never been to a place where you needed to use them. It's kind of something people use like in Wyoming and places where they get lots and lots of snow kind of all year round. Troy says, you got 250 pound support snowshoes. They're awkward as hell, but legit, you don't sink into the snow. You used to use them when you used to hike in Colorado for three years. And then you're saying half the people haven't seen snow. Like, that's my point. Yeah, it's like... I, I'd rather talk about things that people have experience with, but at least you do, uh, Troy. But uh, the idea is that snowshoes allow you to walk on the snow because they distribute your weight out over, they kind of look like tennis rackets, don't they? Is that accurate? Sand shoes, is that a thing? Well, you don't usually, you don't really usually sink into the sand. Snowshoes are safe so that they basically just, uh, they spread your, your weight out over a much larger area. It's like walking on tennis rackets, at least from what I've seen. But again, I've never done it before. So what do I know? Um, yeah. Yes, that's a really good example, Astro Lover. That's a really good example. Heels versus regular shoes. Absolutely. Yeah, the pressure you feel on your feet and heels, you feel more of it right on the heel because 
you have that little tiny uh, um, thing supporting it. Whereas with your shoes, the pressure is evenly distributed all over your shoes. That's a really good example. That's a really good example. Okay, are you all ready to take a break? That's what they look like. Okay. So they kind of look like skis, don't they? They're like just big fat. Yeah. So those, those, those are the snowshoes. And the idea is you walk around those and you won't kind of fall into the snow, basically. Does it actually work? Can you actually walk on top of snow with these things, Troy? Without sinking in? That's really neat. That must be really cool. Donald says, is that why people stuck on thin ice are rescued by people on a boat? Oh, so that they don't like walk over the ice and maybe break through it? Is that what you're saying? You climbed Mount Evans in a blizzard, a 14,000 altitude mountain, and then the snow was roughly three to four feet deep. That's an impressive, uh, that's an impressive feat to climb a mountain in a blizzard. That must have been very, very challenging. Okay, let's take a break. Donald, I will try to answer your question. I just need to stop the video. I don't want to make it too long. What am I doing here? Shift F8.